Well, hello and welcome to Solar Alberta's 2023 Solar Series. Today's webinar is called Energy Reimagined, the Basics of Microgrids. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director of Solar Alberta. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today from Amiskwichiwaska Hagen, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including the Papa Chase, Nehewak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot and Nakoda Sioux, nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. We were delighted to have so many people register for this event today. Please note that we will be recording the webinar for future distribution. Today we'll be hearing from two informative speakers. Dr. Andrea Kraj will explain microgrids and how solar can be integrated integral to them. And then Craig Lytle will share a concrete example of a successful solar powered microgrid at Nipica Mountain Resort. Following the presentations, there will be a Q&A period in which you can all participate. The formal Q&A will run until about a quarter past the hour, and then we'll be inviting you all to join us for an additional 15 minutes in a more relaxed Zoom meeting Q&A at the end. The link for the extended Q&A will be posted in the chat at the end of the formal time, and I will draw your attention to it at that time. So please make sure to click on that link before leaving the webinar. The entire session will wrap up in an hour and a half. In an effort to increase accessibility to the content that we are offering, we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During our formal Q&A period, we'll be using the Zoom Q&A uh, box for questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. Also, please click on the little thumbs up symbols to upvote questions that you like. Before we move forward, we're just going to do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So please take a minute to answer the question popping up on your screen now. And while some are still doing the poll, I encourage you to also take a minute, pop your name, your land acknowledgement, any contact info that you're comfortable sharing in the chat now and throughout the event so that others can look you up on LinkedIn or email you and hopefully some relationships can begin to be formed. All right, let's get a sense of that uh, poll and the results. Excellent, so lots of solar curious folks in the audience today, but a good 40% industry professionals and 9% students. So a healthy mix with us today. Looking forward to, to getting to know you all. All right, a little about Solar Alberta before we get started. This is actually our 32nd year of operation. We are a nonprofit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do so by advocating, by educating, and serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 600 individuals and businesses. So to keep up to date on all our activities, please sign up for our newsletter at solaralberta.ca. We provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory and request for quotes system through our website. In this way, we act as a bridge for installers, suppliers, and other solar related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on this slide, and we're going to be posting a link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs, such as this solar seminar series, and a number of in-person and online networking events each year. Our next solar seminar series uh, event will be held on July 22nd at noon, and it will feature the new Renfrew Solar Carport, which is a community generation installation at the Telespark Science Center in Calgary. And we'll also review all the ways that solar is a great neighbor. So we are still looking for a sponsor for that session. If you'd like to sponsor, you can contact our public outreach lead, Mackenzie Velders, by emailing partners at solaralberta.ca. And registration will be opening soon. 
He also, also hosts an annual online conference and trade show called The Solar Show. So please save January 29th to February 2nd, 2024 for our next Solar Show. Recordings of our last three Solar Show sessions can be found on our YouTube channel. In addition to the public education we provide, we also host a number of live online courses at very affordable rates for solar industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Classes will be starting up again this fall on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. And once again, there's a 10% discount for members. Registration for fall courses open just this morning. Uh, if you're keen to get started on your learning before the fall, though, you can alternatively purchase pre-recorded courses and workshops on our website. And if you're not already, I encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. We are constantly evolving our member service offerings, some of which include discounts on our courses and workshops, access to member only content and more. Individual membership is $35 and can be purchased at the link in the chat. If you're looking to support our work, uh, please consider volunteering or donating as well. The links to be a general volunteer is being popped in the chat now as well as our crowdfunding page where any donations made to Solar Alberta will be matched by the Government of Alberta. So we're excited to announce our new membership stream, Solar Powered Memberships. This stream is for organizations who are demonstrating leadership by installing solar arrays. Benefits for this membership include a profile of your solar journey on our blog, social media and newsletter, that have over 19,000 followers combined, exclusive member updates, discounts, and more. Learn more about this new membership stream through the link in the chat, and please encourage those in your networks and communities who are solar powered organizations to join our community. Now, without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out to Greengate Power for sponsoring today's session in particular. And thanks as well to EPCOR for sponsoring the year's seminar series as a whole. We really couldn't offer all of this amazing free content without the support of our sponsors. We're always interested in developing more partnerships for our events. So if you or your company want to work with us to educate the public about solar and solar related technologies, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now I'd like to welcome and introduce our speakers for the day. Dr. Andrea Kraj is CEO and president of the Core Renewable Energy. She completed her PhD, MSc and BSc in engineering and is a pioneer leader in developing advanced energy systems. She is a Fulbright scholar and practicing professional engineer specialized in intelligent energy systems and smart grid technology for smart cities. She is also on the board of directors of our partner, Canria representing Behind the Meter Systems and is a Vice President of the World Wind Energy Association. With more than 20 years of experience, her work has enabled enhancements in rural electrification and less dependence on fossil fuels. Her work has supported those in remote areas such as in Northern communities, First Nations and tropical island nations. She is an accomplished author and speaker and hosts her, hosts her two podcasts the newly launched Energy Exchange podcast and FemPower for celebrating women in the fields of technology, trades, entrepreneurship, engineering, arts, athletics, mathematics, and science to empower and inspire others. Welcome, Andrea. I am going to introduce our second speaker and then I'll turn the mic over to you. Our second speaker today is Greg Lytle. Greg has been involved with the operations at Nipica Mountain Resort for the past year, 20 years, where he has assisted with their off-grid power solutions. Prior, prior to retirement, Greg had over 40 years of professional experience in electronic, electrical engineering in various industries. This includes serving as a principal at Ozone Technologies, as well as in positions at Wind River Systems, Nortel Networks and GE Energy. Greg has a BSc in engineering with a minor in computer engineering from the University of Calgary and an electronics engineering technology diploma from SAIT. So welcome Andrea and Greg. We're so pleased you could join us today. I'm going to turn the mic and the screen over to you, Andrea, to begin your presentation. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to share my screen for everyone. I'll just wait for your confirmation that it's a go. You can let me know. Perfect. 
Wonderful. So I'm so excited to be here. I'm joining you from Treaty One in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I have been working in this area for a long time. It's wonderful to find an opportunity to speak to it uh, in more detail. So um, today's talk will be about the basics of microgrids and a little bit probably anecdotal stories from my experience. And so um, let me just see why. <laughs> it's not going. Oh, there we go. All right. So really what's happening with microgrids and why this is so important right now, the conversation is changing because we're shifting our energy paradigm. And that means the way that we inhabit the cities of tomorrow cannot be created by the ways of today. Everywhere there's energy and our relationship to it is really changing. We have pollution in our environment that's no longer acceptable. We're risking lives uh, with fuel being transported through vulnerable communities. And the styles of the operations of business entities are also changing. We're moving from monopolized centralized systems to more decentralized systems. So it's a very interesting time as we move through this energy transition. And as we see the landscape is changing, we have seen a massive drop in the costs of renewable energy technology, particularly solar and wind, which has resulted in an unprecedented adoption of renewables, while we're still seeing an ever increasing demand for energy. There's still a frustration among everyone about increasing in prices and cost of living due to these prices of energy rising, and also the questioning of, is it just the way that it's doing? Is it, are we doing the right thing? Is it fair? We are also seeing the rise of the prosumer, which is a consumer who no longer only uh, takes power from the grid, consumes power, but is able to sell it back to the grid. And sometimes in excess, other times it's purely business and transactional. And sometimes it's enabled this way because of progressive policies that allow this to happen. And also because of the rise of corporate PPAs, which is a really hot topic. We are yet encountering natural disasters frequently, and they're devastating from wildfires in our own backyard, especially the season to disasters abroad, hurricanes. We see this happen where communities are completely wiped out. And the demand to rebuild in these regions is to leapfrog business as usual and to solve this crisis with solutions that perhaps might not exist today. And the status quo is no longer acceptable. People demand this. They want to have power and they want to have good quality of life. So as we look to islands and remote communities and even our remote rural communities in Northern uh, Canada, we need to see these communities as being progressive and being able to, oh my goodness, of course, this, there's always something funny that happens during a presentation and I just had a large insect crawl across my desk. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, so islands and remote, com remote communities are want these progressive um, rural regions to adapt and change and move forward, as well as in urban centers. Um, urban centers are starting to see changes as well. And this will lead the future to the change and the adoption of, of different ways that we integrate our energy. And microgrids are really at the heart of this because of energy security. And energy security is the biggest threat that faces humanity, and it, it affects all of us. It affects our livelihood and quality of life, and right down to the basic water we need to survive, and vital surgeries, as well as for our hospitals, and to provide sustenance, sustenance through food and preservation of food, um, and of course, medicine. So we often take these things for granted when we have a stable grid, but there are many, many places, not only in our own backyard, that are not connected to really stable, resilient, robust, reliable systems. And so if we really want to move forward on this, we need to address these issues, not only because of the high costs, but also because it's unjust and we need to move to systems that are more reliable. And what I found through my years of working in this field is that without the ability to produce our own energy in our own communities, we do remain under the control of foreign interests of taking things from places that we cannot um, perhaps always get access to. And so this becomes a big question in our remote communities and how to enable communities to get um, energy. And so we need to move to energy resilience. This is where we put these transitions into action and where we see the benefits of these results. And energy sovereignty requires that we use indigenous natural resources that are local to the population. 
And so when I was looking further into this problem, what I discovered was that we cannot just solve this using one type of resource. It cannot be just wind. It cannot be just solar. And this is because they're inherently variable in their nature. And when resources are variable, it is there, there's this likelihood for instability and, and blackouts and brownouts and so on. And so what we need to do is find the right combination of resources at the right location with the proper amount of storage. And then we can move any region to become more autonomous and uh, more renewable because of this reliable and more robust supply when you have multiple resources and generation. So this is where microgrids come in. So there are some components that we group in um, our terminology and definition of microgrids. We have, um, well, let's start just with the gener general definition. And a microgrid is a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources that act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. And it can connect and disconnect from the grid to operate in grid connected or island mode. And microgrids can improve customer reliability and resilience to grid disturbances. And we'll get into how that happens. So essentially what we have is demand, which is load, customer load. And then we have a way to provide that, which is our generation. And then of course the gaps to fill that needs to be filled in with storage. Microgrid systems require storage. It's not even, um, you can operate without it, but it's not, I wouldn't necessarily define it as a microgrid, but we'll get to that. And of course, then you have everything that controls it and, and brings it together, which we call the network itself or the grid. And advanced microgrids are enable local power generation assets, including traditional generators, renewables, and storage to keep the local grid running, even when there are larger grid disturbances or interruptions, and in remote areas where there's no connection to a larger grid. So this is called islanding if, if there, oh, excuse me, if there is no um, uh, connection to that, low, that larger grid, you would be an islanded microgrid. Now uh, we'll get into a little bit how islands can also work within connected grids. Also advanced microgrids allow local assets to work together to save costs, extend duration of energy supplies and produce revenue through market participation. And this is where CORE, uh, my company, is what we call the smart microgrid because when we start to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, having our systems learn together and improve um, all around, we can find efficiencies in those systems that can actually improve them and strengthen them and provide um, a better performance, which leads to better quality of the grid. So um, here's a nice schematic of a microgrid. And you might wonder what all the lines are. Don't worry about that. That's just a, a layout of how these are interconnected. But what you can see is that we have different types of generation through the PV panel, wind turbine, as well as through, um, you, you know, there are, uh, I think there's, yeah, um, not on this one, but we have battery storage and flywheels, which are under the storage category. And then of course, fuel cells and supercapacitor storage, which are also um, part of the storage side of it. We also have heat loads. So microgrids can account for heating as well as electrification. So CHP, which is combined heat and power can be used to um, tackle those, those two areas. And so within here, we have the controllers that uh, work around managing the whole system. But a deep technical talk, I'm always open to that for another day. So don't worry about that for today, but at least you have a picture of what is happening here. Now, um, in the early days of hybrid systems, uh, just so you know, we can go back all the way to Denmark with um, a Danish wind turbine scientist called Paul Lecour. And this is the picture of the wind turbine at the top of the page here. And there's a house at the bottom of it. And I've actually been there. The wind turbine is no longer there. And in the back of that building there, you see the second building towards the back, that is where the storage was kept in the basement. And what Paul did was that he used the wind turbine to generate electricity. And that electricity was then used for electrolysis in order to produce hydrogen for the gas lights in his school, because he was very concerned with having proper lighting in the schools in Denmark. So it was really a community energy project and they used the wind energy um, for, for this purpose. Um, now, the other one we look to is Thomas Edison. And of course, these both were happening in the 1800s. 
Um, so Thomas Edison used the first power plant in 1882 in the US in Manhattan. And this micro was considered a microgrid because it was not connected. There was no centralized grid. And what happened there, um, Thomas was using the coal fire steam engines that drove six jumbo uh, generators and they were producing um, over a thousand kilowatts of DC power. Now in the evolution of this and where I got caught into all of this was in this transition of moving hybrid systems away from diesel. And this was back in the day when we were not ready, readily calling them microgrids. So there was this sort of gap in time where Okay, now we're moving back to using different types of renewables and integrating them. Um, we have hybrid systems, but what if we want to do more? And a hybrid system was typically looked at as just a diesel genset and a wind uh, turbine at the time. And, and so what I, when I got involved in this, I started to question, well, can we do better? How can we do better? And this is where it came around designing these systems that eventually would lead to what we call now microgrids. And these multi-renewable energy systems, as I called them, allowed... Um, or these different renewable technologies to integrate with existing diesel gensets if they were there, as well as other bring on other types of storage. So as in the display shown here, we have battery banks and compressed energy, compressed air energy storage also in the mix. Now these systems could be localized or islanded, as I mentioned earlier, and they can also be um, islands that can disconnect from one another or connect, depending on how the grid is designed. And so this is why we say microgrids can contribute to the larger grid, as well as be separated. And this leads to resilience and robustness in the system. Now, there's different types of microgrids and lots of questions around how do we explain this? So I thought I'd explain hybrid, pico, nano, and micro. So hybrid, as I mentioned earlier, typically didn't have storage. Sometimes it, it can still have storage and sometimes people still refer to it as a hybrid uh, system, but uh, we don't usually think of it in the same way. We've really moved microgrids outside of that. Um, and, and the hybrid system was usually one type of storage, one type of generator, for example, the genset wind turbine, which I mentioned. Whereas Pico Nano systems, replicate something a little bit more around what we know as microgrids on the larger scale, which are greater than five kilowatts, but the Pico Nano has fallen to um, either less than one kilowatt if you're Pico and Nano is between one and five kilowatts. So a lot smaller, smaller scale, if you're thinking camping or a one-off little system for backup on a just not really integrated, um, you're looking at something like that, perhaps camping. Whereas when you move into a microgrid system, you're looking at systems that are greater than five kilowatts. We see these on residential microgrids, commercial, industrial, utility scale, and up. And so um, there's a lot of information around that one. Now, this, this is what's really interesting is the undergrid. Uh, this has come out recently. It was with uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, did a project in Nigeria. And what they found was that there was this often overlooked population, a population as large as that would be living off grid and they faced um, the same challenges. So they, they were sort of connected, but really disconnected. And they would not have regular power. It was only maybe for two to four hours a day. And so this population called the undergrid, people who were, um, like I, I mentioned, did not have the opportunity to have stable, resilient, affordable power now has become a place where microgrids can easily and um, very accessibly make change. And so what has happened is the solution can re-empower communities through battery energy um, service, which I mentioned, and create a $200 million opportunity for project developers and save distribution companies up to $6 million each because to connect to these communities was just costing um, distribution companies too much. So it's really interesting if you look into that further, it's called the undergrid. So let's talk a little bit about generation on that scale. What I call the renewable energy spectrum. You might wonder, well, what can connect to a renewable, to a microgrid? Um, of course, anything solar. Um, so typically we see here PV photovoltaic systems. There are also uh, solar thermal systems and different types of solar, such as concentrated solar power. Um, these, I'm giving you the whole spectrum. Wind has onshore and offshore. We don't see any offshore uh, microgrids. That's a very different application, but just so you know what's happening in there, you can have onshore um, wind, bioenergy systems through all sorts of mechanisms as I've listed on the page, water, there are tidal systems, wave and run of river and small hydro. 
these systems can be integrated into microgrids depending on where they're located. A lot of things there are still quite um, experimental. And storage. Batteries are um, quite conventional on all sorts of scales, and there are still a lot of um, in remote and in research and development types of batteries, of course. Pumped hydro storage, that's the PHS, is a type of storage where we pump water up and then spill it down through generators uh, when needed. Case or compressed air energy storage is another one of these, but we're compressing air for storage and flywheels. So one of the things we'll get to shortly is when and where with these batteries. But first of all, why? Why do we need more than one resource? So if you take a snapshot of a wind uh, profile, what you see is there is variability in it. It's up and down at all times of day, and it's very rarely zero, very rarely. Uh, this is just a small one month data set snapshot. When you look at solar, we see variability in solar too. Across three days, we're, we're going to have very different solar, but we know it comes every day, and we know it's at a regular interval for this amount of time, depending on the season. So quite often, we know what we can do with solar. And when you put it together and you overlap it, as we do at core, you can see what is happening when and where the gaps are and what is going to supply what, <laughs> what you need for load. So in this example here, we know when the sun is shining with the yellow, we know the, when the blue is, is blowing with the blue wind is blowing. We know the red is the demand. And then we have these other parts where we're filling in with bio uh, energy in the green or um, other storage such as compressed air in purple. And so this will supply our um, day. And, and when we build our systems, we build them out so that the intelligent control system tells us when to optimize the system. And so in terms of storage, what are the storage options? options in microgrids. And this really depends on your application and purpose. So if you look at different scales, there's different power rates and different time periods. And what you need to do is match that storage to what you want to do. And that's why we, we say everything from super capacitors on the immediate um, response up until pumped hydro, compressed air, and then on the long term, and then of course flywheels in between. And there's these sections called bridging power. And so it really depends if you're doing power quality, if you're doing bridging power, or if you're doing energy management. In terms of the network, how does this come together? Well, you can have distributed generation, but it isn't often optimized. And so this is where what happens is that we need to have a distributed intelligent generation system where the systems are talking together. That's in order to maximize and operate efficiently. And this is why um, I say distributed generation is not enough. It's great, it's a great step, but let's make it intelligent and make sure it's communicating well and that it's optimized so that we are really performing better in the most vulnerable of situations. Because when you're operating a microgrid, it is um, quite a delicate situation sometimes. So this is um, where we can say when we have the compiled green picture of what it looks like if we have our sun, our wind, our battery, and our biofuels all, or biomass in this case, um, all together, where is the peak? Where does it match? And you can see in our flow here, we were matching and, and meeting the load on the red um, in this uh, visualization. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities? Okay, there's lots of benefits. Let's just go through them quickly though, because it's there are challenges. We want to get to that. One of the benefits is autonomy. So microgrids, they allow generation and storage and loads to seamlessly operate together. And this is wonderful, especially if you are vulnerable to um, you know, having fuel supply come to your community, or if you have something where you need to power up independently. Autonomy is key. Um, and you want to be able to have that. The stability of it is, is really built up by having those different resources come together. That's the beauty of the microgrid is that it builds the stability and reliability because you've got different sources to rely on. And of course, flexibility. Um, you can mix and match in various ways um, and also connect to the grid or island from it, as I mentioned. And scalability. Microgrids are great because it's a little bit of like plug and play as long as they're designed well and you're planned for that. That's why we say at core, the power is in the plan because you need to plan for what you want to do in your short and in your long term of when you are designing and, and putting out these um, microgrids. And of course, the efficiency. You can optimize this both around economics environmental factors, and of course, performance. So balancing these things out, what we see is that the benefits and the challenges, it's, I kind of put them kind of like, they're not obviously balanced, but they, 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 they teeter <laughs> because you can have optimized generation performance outcomes that are wonderful. Um, 
you can gain affordability in a lot of cases, depending on the price point of what you're paying for your energy. And of course, the resilience and autonomy builds safety. And I do have a story to tell you, but I will get to that in, when I give you an example. And in terms of challenges, it, there's these rec the recognized value of microgrids is still a challenge. Some people don't understand that value. And so it's important to communicate that. We do need policy and support mechanisms, training, education, and sometimes people see them as being complex. So we need education to help and skills development. So let's talk about some of these applications. Um, in the US, I'll give you a snapshot of what's happening there because there's a nice picture of it. There's nearly 100 island communities in the US. And um, these communities are island and meaning their connection to a centralized electric grid is non-existent or they're remote, rural or both. And so these communities, they vary in size and geography and climate, culture and economy. They all face significant energy and infrastructure challenges. And they are um, might be different in those respects, but the risks are similar and the vulnerabilities are similar. So we see similar opportunities like this in Canada. So when we take a look across the U.S., these are some of the communities. We range all the way from Hawaii, where I spent last summer working with micro communities, uh, microgrid communities there, all the way to up north in Alaska um, and to the East Coast. I want to talk a little bit about a project we did in Brazil. This was a challenging deployment environment because the island power grid and the extreme weather phenomena, but it is also offshore. It's a small island. It doesn't have a very large footprint, 18 square kilometers, 3,000 plus inhabitants. We uh, designed um, a microgrid solution that involved wind, solar, biomass, and battery and compressed air with the existing genset because it was already in place. And what we found was that um, the increased renewable energy penetration offset the diesel supply and allowed for greater autonomy uh, in supply of the system. So it's a great case study. Caterpillar microgrid is um, one that is in um, the proving grounds in Tucson, Arizona, and it is around 500 kilowatts. It's got PV along with short-term energy storage in the form of batteries and ultra capacitors to supplement power. And it is uh, also uses um, a diesel genset there. It's found that it has reduced fuel consumption by about 33%. And then I just wanted to mention the Quorum Powerhouse. And this is the example I wanted to tell you because we're seeing microgrids now being deployed in residential areas. This one happens to have um, about 15 kilowatts of uh, solar with battery storage and an EV charger at a level two as well as um, it's connected, connected to the grid, but it can be disconnected. It can island through um, a system where it powers only auxiliary loads as needed. Um, the environment, environmental impact to date, which we've been tracking for about 10 months, has been about 178 trees, equivalent to 178 trees planted and about 10.8 tons of CO2 reduction. And so what was really powerful about this house, um, not only because of what happens with the fact that it's a microgrid um, is that on the level of what the impact was to the family, I can tell you the story was once um, one evening I got a text from um, the client saying how thankful they were because they were the only home in the neighborhood that had their lights on and they had a family situation um, that it was really dependent on medical needs. And because they could keep the lights on, it was life changing for them in their family. Um, rather than having a risk in a medical uh, last minute medical situation. So keeping that in mind is pretty impactful. And that's why we really um, like to call this our empower house, because we do believe that these types of microgrids can really empower um, many people on a, a very personal and also at the residential level as well. And we just had an article come out on that if you want to read more about it. So that's all I have to say right now. Um, thank you so much. If you do want to reach out to me, my email is on uh, the page here, it's akraj at coreenergy.ca. You're welcome to visit our website, coreenergy.ca. And you can always um, find me on LinkedIn as under Andrea Cry. And um, I would love to connect with you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take those after um, in the question room. And right now I'm gonna pass the mic and the screen to my colleague, Greg. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was a wonderful presentation. It, uh, I think, really uh, gives everybody a great perspective on uh, the progress we've made and uh, on microgrids and where the technology is heading. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Mm 
And okay, so um, again, thank you very much. My name is Greg Lytle. I'm one of the uh, directors at Nipica Mountain Resort. Uh, Nipica is a small wilderness resort which was founded by Lyle Wilson in the uh, well, first of all, I'll go through a little overview here. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history of uh, Nipica and, and what we're about. I'll uh, tell you a little bit about our history of uh, where we started about 25 years ago with an off-grid system. Um, talk to some of the upgrades we've made over time and also speak to where we are today with our current system and uh, some of the conclusions we've come to from a user perspective. So Nipica is a, a small wilderness resort, which was founded by Lyle Wilson in the late 1990s. Lyle had a vision for an eco resort where people could relax and enjoy lifestyle activities in a mountain environment. Uh, Steve Wilson, Lyle's son, is now the uh, general manager of Nipica, and he's responsible for the operations uh, with his team of staff. We're located. Um, just uh, outside uh, Kootenai National Park um, off Highway 93. We're about 35 kilometers east of Radium Hot Springs. or about 250 kilometers west of Calgary. Uh, to give you a little bit of idea of the size of our operations, we have nine guest cabins. They vary in size from our largest cabin, which is about 13. Then uh, there's a few eight-person cabins, um, and uh, they they go down to two-person uh, cabins, so it, we're able to accommodate a range of guest sizes. Uh, the log cabins were sustainably built by Steve Wilson using logs that were harvested from the, our wood lot, and they were um, um, taken from the property uh, when the 50 kilometers of cross-country ski trails were developed uh, as part of the development of the resort. In addition to the guest cabins, we have staff accommodation, an event barn, and a rental shop, um, and also a workshop to support the operations of the resort, and a commercial laundry for taking care of linens on site on the resort. So a range of uh, power requirements. Uh, Nipica uh, is all about um, trying to promote sustainable activities in a mountain environment. We have 50 kilometers of groomed cross-country ski trails, 30 kilometers of fat bike trails for people to enjoy in the winter. In the summer, these trails make up a network of hiking, trail running, cross-country or uh, trail um, uh, hiking and mountain biking and uh, were uh, largely on the Cross River Canyon rec site, which uh, we managed with in conjunction of uh, Recreation BC. So in terms of our requirements for a microgrid system for our resort operations, uh, the ethos of NEPICA is to be in harmony with the natural environment while still providing a high quality guest experience. We want to be able to provide guests with uh, conveniences they have at home, such as uh, we have uh, propane powered fridges and stoves, but uh, the, the balance of our um, loads are on our electrical network. And uh, guests want to be able to charge their computer, or their phones, um, uh, uh, LED lighting throughout the resort. We have um, for example, LED lighting on our uh, pond, which serves as a hockey rink in the, in the winter months. So we want to be able to extend that for evening use. And then uh, we need power for, as I mentioned before, our on-site laundry and shop uh, for construction projects and such. So there's uh, other, other power needs that go beyond just the, the guests. So this is a, a little bit of an overview of where we started back in uh, the late uh, 1990s or early 2000s. Um, at that time, um, again, because we are um, off-grid, 
we're about 35 kilometers away from the grid. Um, there's no cell service in, in our location either. So uh, we didn't have an option to connect to a grid and there's no ec economically feasible way to do that. So we have to develop our own power system. And in the early days, solar was uh, relatively expensive. Um, so we opted for a small PV system, uh, a diesel generator, and uh, we also developed a small uh, nano turbine that was installed on a creek on the property site. Um, we also had uh, some storage. So we had a, tw uh, I think we started with a 20 kilowatt lead acid battery bank. And these were connected to an inverter uh, and the loads on the system. Um, because power was, or the uh, the cost of solar was relatively expensive, but at the time the generator would be used to top up the battery bank when um, we didn't have sufficient solar resources or water resources. And, uh, but you still wanted that storage because you don't want to be able to, or you, you didn't want to be running the generator all the time when somebody turns on a light. So you want it to be essentially running off the battery bank with uh, the digital generator just coming on intermittently when you, either the inverter couldn't supply the peak loads or uh, or the other resources uh, weren't adequate to, to, to charge the batteries. So over... Uh, the last 20 years, we've had to do a number of upgrades to our system um, as equipment uh, needed replacement or as the resort grew. Um, over time, we added, uh, we expanded the resort and added additional cabins, which required additional loads. And at the same time, we saw, you know, big changes in the, and lowering costs in the, in the alternate energy and PV system. So we want to take advantage of that. So um, one of the things we did early on was remove the nano hydro turbine uh, because of reliability issues. We just found that uh, on our particular creek, um, the system wasn't as practical as we'd hoped. So it became um, a big maintenance hassle and uh, was less than reliable, um, you know, having to deal with um, you know, variable flow on our creek between the summer and winter months and, and debris and clogging um, in spring runoff. So uh, we have to take that uh, out of the system and upgrade the, the solar and batteries to compensate for that. Over time, we, I think, replaced the, the lead acid batteries three times, and uh, we ended up, uh, over time, um, updating from about a 20 kilowatt hour system to a 44 kilowatt hour system and uh, updated the PV array uh, from uh, us, their original small 2.5 kilowatts to 8.3 kilowatts um, about five years ago. And then uh, in the last year or so, we've done a major update again where we've uh, added a new PV array, new battery storage, new inverters, and a new control system to integrate everything together to, again, improve the reliability and minimize our generator use. So here's a schematic of our current system. Um, so we've got now two uh, uh, reasonable size PV arrays uh, feeding into charge controllers. We've got a new uh, lithium iron phosphate battery bank, and uh, we still have our existing uh, diesel generator, which uh, is uh, used for backup or when there uh, isn't uh, sufficient solar to uh, charge our batteries. And we've got new inverters uh, supplying our loads. Here's a little, uh, some additional details on our uh, PV system. So we've got two reasonable size arrays. Um, we've got different modules because we purchased them at different times as we incrementally upgraded the system. We've got 27, 270 watt PV modules and then 18, 450 five watt PV module. So that gives us a total solar capacity of about 15.5 kilowatts, which is uh, more than adequate for our uh, current requirements. There's a bit of a view of our existing uh, 
systems that are located in a, in a storage room in our shop. Um, so it consists of the charge controllers, the inverters, our uh, battery bank, and uh, diesel gen set. With a new system, we upgraded the inverters, as I mentioned. So we've got now two dual 6.8 6 kilowatt inverters uh, to give us a total of 13.5 kilowatts continuous. For short periods of time, we, uh, the system will support 17 kilowatt outputs and, or 26 kilowatts for uh, uh, surge uh, supply. So that's important when you've got heavy loads or uh, momentary surges that you don't want the inverter to be kicking over and having to start the gen set for just a transient load. So systems work very well uh, in, in those situations to be able to supply our peaks. Uh, we also have um, the inverter system set up so it auto starts the generator when the uh, load exceeds what the inverter is going to output, um, which seldom happens in our case, or um, in the case where you don't have enough solar generation and the system monitors the state of charge of the batteries and uh, will start the generator to uh, re recharge the batteries when, when required. One of the uh, most significant updates we've uh, we've done over the last year was replace our older lead acid batteries with new lithium iron phosphate batteries. So we've got eight 7.5 kilowatt hour uh, batteries uh, connected in parallel for a 59 kilowatt hour battery bank. There's a nominal voltage of about 50 volts, 52 volts. Um, one of the great things about these new lithium batteries is they have uh, really impressive uh, maximum charge and discharge rates, um, which uh, allow us to uh, really minimize the, the generator runtime because you can charge the batteries quickly with a shorter um, uh, generator op with shorter generator operation. Um, the limiting factor really here is the amount that the inverters can charge the, the batteries at, not the uh, maximum charge current that the batteries can take. So I think our inverters are uh, rated at about 12.5 kilowatts for battery charging. So we could charge our system from uh, essentially low batteries to 80% battery rate in about four hours um, of generator operation. Um, and uh, I think the, the system's configured right now to charge the batteries up to about 80%. Um, that can be tweaked up to 95% to get the full capacity of the batteries, but uh, we typically run it at up to 80% to maximize the battery life over the course of the system. The, one of the considerations with lithium iron phosphate batteries as opposed to lead acid is the temperature operating, operating range. So here really the uh, limiting factor is the charge temperature for the battery system, uh, which is zero to 45. Um, in our case, this isn't an issue because we've got um, them in a heated uh, shop space. And uh, so uh, we can maintain the, the uh, reasonable uh, 20, 15 to 20 C um, uh, range for the battery environment. Um, but that's a consideration if you want to run your system uh, where you don't have uh, any way of uh, moderating the temperature. The discharge temperature range for these batteries is greater, but uh, that's not really a limiting factor in our, our particular case. Some of the other great advantages of the uh, these batteries over our older lead acid batteries is the uh, is effectively zero maintenance, so you don't really have to worry about uh, checking water levels and topping them up and um, and being very careful as we had to do with our lead acid batteries in the past. So that's really minimized the maintenance and and uh, made it a, a lot easier. You don't you don't uh, have the same considerations with acid and um, and uh, safety as well or. Uh, the battery is off-gassing, um, like the lead-acid batteries. Um, they're smaller, they're lighter weight as well, and uh, in uh, in practice, they should have a longer service life, so they should uh, be reliable for years to come. 
they also have a smart BMS integrated into the batteries, which uh, gives uh, improved system integration and monitoring with uh, the balance of the system. Our system also re uh, includes a remote dashboard. Um, you know, this with this you can uh, connect via a smartphone or, or computer and uh, look at the system monitoring and tracking of the overall system and look at remote di diagnostics or uh, tuning of the system. Um, that's been really helpful and uh, useful for uh, uh, just uh, keeping track of where the system is at. Um, we're still working on upgrading our IT resources with a new Starlink system. So uh, we uh, hope to get this integrated into that and for offsite uh, diagnostics and, and, uh, and troubleshooting as well. But uh, that's something that we're, we're still building on. So um, overall, our experience with our upgraded uh, microgrid system has, uh, uh, has been very positive. It's, uh, it's given us uh, some really significant uh, improvements in the system. Um, the biggest one has been that we've been able to cut our annual generator runtime from uh, 1,200 hours a year uh, before we, we did this upgrade to about 180 hours now. And that represents, you know, uh, probably about a 85% uh, reduction in fuel. We uh, see faster charge times with the new battery bank, as I indicated before, um, which is great because it means that the generator is on less, that minimizes the noise and uh, emissions um, around the property and improves our guest experience. And uh, we've seen just really rock solid reliability with the system as it's been set up right now. So, you know, we're seeing the environmental benefits and reliability benefits of the uh, you know, PV system. So in conclusion, um, nipico has been running this microgrid system for the past 25 years um, because we don't really have any other options. There's no grid in, in place. Um, the microgrid system has been able to uh, um, operate it in a sustainable and reliable way. Uh, the current systems are proven to be very re reliable with minimal maintenance. And the improvements in the off-grid panels and battery technology um, have really allowed us to expand the system in an affordable way and minimize our generator uh, usage over time. So that's been a game changer in terms of really uh, delivering on our commitment to uh, really be an eco um, green resort. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the design and build um, that Skyfire Energy provided for our system. They've been helping us out for the last uh, well, 15 years to 20 years. Um, uh, we've had great support uh, for um, from the team at Skyfire, and I uh, encourage you to reach out with them if you've got any uh, our energy requirements. And uh, if you have any questions for me, uh, my contact information is available, and I'll pass it back to Heather. Well, thanks, Greg. Appreciate that presentation very much. It's so helpful to have a concrete example of all of this. Andrea, if you could join us now and we'll end your screen share, Greg, and just have the two of you up on screen with me. That would be perfect. You can leave your camera on, Greg, for this Q&A mm, period. Sure. So just a reminder to everybody who's joined us today that we are going to be using the Q&A box for questions rather than the chat. So make sure you're popping questions in there. Also encourage you to upvote any questions that you would like uh, us to focus on with um, about 100 people in the audience today. We may not get to all of the questions, so it's very important that you use the upvote feature. All right, let's kick this off. Gordon Howell, one of our original board members and members has a question here. Does the, it's for you, Greg, does the Nipica Resort need to use the diesel genset anymore now that it has the large solar PV system and large battery? Really, the only time that we see the generator use coming on is uh, in the winter months when we don't have sufficient solar resources. So, and uh, 
So it's it, it's really minimal. And as I've indicated, we've really cut it back in a significant way. Mm -hmm. And Angela is wondering, do you know how much it costs for a residential system? Now, Greg, yours is, is multiple units. So um, this may be a question you both have to tag team, but folks are looking for costs here. Do you want to kick us off, Greg? Yeah, I think uh, I would say, you know, we've made multiple investments over time. Um, you know, I think um, $25,000 would be a reasonable uh, residential system to start, um, you know, based on our experience. But, um, you know, really, um, our system is maybe a little more unique because of the, the big storage component. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there, Andrea? Yeah, I would just... Um remind everyone that it depends on what components you want, because you could have a state-of-the-art system, top-of-the-line panels, top-of-the-line batteries, top-of-the-line controllers, versus just get something functioning, which is a totally different scale. So really depends on what your needs are. It depends where you're located, how good your resources, um, how well you could position panels on either um, wherever you are, if it's your rooftop or on the ground, however. And um, of course, what your jurisdiction's regulations are for interconnection, if you are going to connect, all of these need to be factored into the economic model. So there's lots of variables. So it's really hard to say just off the top for me. Yeah, and I know that for a lot of folks in Alberta, they end up going with the grid connection um, because they can then take advantage of the solar power pricing programs that are in place. And of course, that's not optional for NIPICA. Um, but for those who can stay connected to the grid and, you know, essentially uh, earn more credits on their utility bill, that's very tempting. So they may then uh, fall within the micro generation regulation and um, only be able to produce as much as they consume on site in, the, in that given year. So definitely different constraints, as you were mentioning, Andrea, based on the regulations and whether you decide to have a grid connection or not. I've also noticed even within, you know, the houses on my block, <laughs> our sizing varies considerably, which tells me that our demand varies considerably. And a lot of it depends as well as if you're going to have electric vehicles hooked up to your system, because that seems to increase the, the size and the cost as well up front for a lot of savings down the road. So lots of factors to consider. Not Paul's everybody wondering. has the uh, appropriate solar um orientation as well on a residential lot or mm. if you're in a rural situation you've got a little more flexibility there as well that's very true if you're retrofitting an older home uh you might not have a great solar ready roof <laughs> um we just put together some solar ready design considerations on our website for folks who are building or retrofitting to try and maximize their solar resource that's a great point because you folks have a ground mount so you can angle it just so <laughs> so paul is wondering andrea is it true that in certain areas and neighborhoods only a certain amount of energy can be exported at a single time for example if there's an area with lots of homes with individual solar systems all trying to export at once there may be a limit to how much of that so this is for folks who are grid connected in Alberta. So I'm sure this is actually probably not, <laughs> you're the behind the meter expert. Do you want to delve into that, Andrea? Or would you rather I take a stab at this one? Cause this very much front yeah. of the meter. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we can both probably answer to that. One of those things is that um, systems that are behind the meter can also still be connected to the grid depending on how they are um, configured. What's really important is what the rules are in your jurisdiction and what, um, and that varies across Canada. One of the things to keep in mind is that energy is provincially regulated. Um, so we'll have different things depending on what just jurisdiction, jurisdiction we're in. And then of course, what our cities are at and how things are set up in new subdivisions versus old and, and what the grid connection might be in within a city based on how well it is developed there. So I'll pass yeah. it. Down. I appreciate that. And Paul, I'm not sure if you're in Alberta, but actually at the solar show last year, we had um, a presentation called um, Microgen Regulation 101. So if you're wondering what Alberta's microgen regulation states, you can definitely check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, really expert advice given there. Um, but yes, so here in Alberta, uh, you are only able to size your system to your overall usage in the year. So if you use 
um, you know, if, if your if your usage is 10, uh, 10 kilowatt uh, hours, then you basically have to match the system. So all of the installers in our directory actually will will help you through that process. We have 150 business members who can coach folks through the process of sizing their array so that it's legal <laughs> and can be approved in Alberta. But yeah, interesting how it differs from province to province. Um, absolutely fascinating. I've been learning about BC and Saskatchewan and how they differ. Here we've got another question from Angela. Do you know how much it costs? Oh, we answered that one already, sorry. Uh, any issues with things that cover your PV panels like snow or reduced output during high smoke events? Um, we do have some information on this in our Solar 101 webinar. We talk about snow uh, and uh, really it's minimal, 3 to 5% in Alberta, in Edmonton in particular, uh, will reduce your production over the course of a year. Um, and that's largely because snow comes when, when um, we don't have a lot of sunlight in northern <laughs> provinces, so it's not really reducing your consumption a lot. Maybe you want to add on that. I'm assuming, uh, Greg and Andrea, that in those darker months, you're drawing a lot more on the battery storage component um, to make a microgrid work. Yeah, um, one of the things I would just add about the snow piece is that we need to look at snow as a porous medium. So it actually lets light through and it reflects, refracts through the pockets within it. Um, so I did a study on this a few years ago and just tracked how much um, light was still coming through. And of course it is decreased because it is covered and so on, but um, it doesn't stop producing because some light does get through. So um, it's not a lot, but there is some, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, and from our... Our experience, uh, just on a practical level, um, because our si system is ground mounted, um, we have a, a, a big pole on, and a brush that we can brush the snow off the panels. But we find also when the sun comes out, the panels heat up and the snow slides off. So even mm -hmm. with uh, doing any maintenance, uh, it, it, it can be easily managed. Yeah, and for your average residential, uh just, you know, installation, most installers will say, don't brush your snow off because you're likely to do more damage than good. <laughs> um, I suspect a lot of people wouldn't have the training you have, Greg, about how to properly brush it. So sure. um, it's interesting how um, it differs for the ground mounts as well, or depending on how much of an angle your roof has uh, to allow for that. But I know a lot of us have been thinking about smoke lately. And the important thing to realize is, is a good solar installer, they're going to size your array thinking about these things. So they're going to know, okay, the wind is going to reduce your production by this much. Your latitude is going to reduce your production by this much. Your, you know, so for example, in Edmonton, they're going to size your array a little bit bigger than in Calgary because our solar generating potential is slightly less for various uh, reasons related to light. So um, you just have to know that the installers will factor in these many things in the sizing of your array. So it can increase costs a little bit though, depending on <laughs> all of those factors, but very interesting thoughts. Okay, what are the challenges you're facing to replace propane powered refrigerators to electric ones? I did see the board lit up because everybody, of course, uh, is thinking a lot about electrifying appliances lately. So maybe Greg, would you mind elaborating a bit on that? Because folks are, are, are really keen to get you to transition your appliances. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and I, I just to get a little historical uh, context is the uh, the propane powered uh, fridges that we installed were when our system wasn't adequate to really uh, be able to power all those uh, or larger loads and it was less economic but uh, now that the pv system costs have come down um, we we plan to replace those propane fridges over, over, as their useful life uh, ends uh, or we just have the, the funds available to add and so now we can we really have the battery and uh, solar capacity to re replace those fridges. Well, that's exciting. I think if you started a crowdfunder today and launched it with these hundred people, they'd probably want to get your fridges swapped out. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a workshop about optimized uh, appliances uh, for you know uh, essentially electrifying your appliances. So um, and uh, it's interesting how many folks are are moving in that direction these days, especially as we learn about natural gas stoves and all of the health implications of having those in a highly efficient home <laughs> where you're breathing in those particles. So, um, of course, that's not the case with a fridge, but 
<laughs> definitely interesting to think about. Um, Gordon's got a very uh, deep question here. Since microgrids have such great benefits, then do we really need to have any connection to a central grid anymore, such as when new subdivisions are built in cities? I think <laughs> we've all been kind of wondering about this in Alberta as our province moves more and more towards an isolationist stance. <laughs> um, how much do we need uh, those interconnections and that grid as a whole? Um, okay, so thanks, Gordon, for that question. I think it's a great question to think about. Um, I, it can go both ways, right? You've already invested, not you personally, but the province and, and the country and so on, has invested in um, infrastructure that has a useful life. So to a point, we have to look at the economics of that. But moving future forward, we do want to start thinking like, is it really necessary? Perhaps we need um, islanded decentralized groupings of, of microgrids that can eff effectively work as a larger integrated grid, um, which would prove to be more efficient and resilient and so on. But the big question is what happens when we get um, perhaps a large scale storm, which we've seen like in recently in Quebec, I believe in Ontario was sending power to them. It was over the Christmas holidays, if I recall. Um, those interconnections, those interprovincial connections are critical and into our security as a country. Um, so it's a deep question. I think um, moving forward, we do have to look if we are building all these subdivisions, what, what are we doing? Because they could have these options to be community microgrids. And really the vision there, and I think what I think is encouraging about it is when we start to think of what, what we call the power block as well is can a community become a safe place because different communities can have their own power and then essentially if one or two streets are forever for whatever reason gets knocked out they're in close proximity to somebody who has resilience that they can go charge their phone or have a hot meal in a winter storm or something like this so that we can keep the lights on also in our communities I think it's really um, important to start changing our mindset around individualism only because I think we need to start looking at our homes not only as our castles but our you know power assets that can also as we are connected in the internet still be connected to others even though we live individually in our homes we remain connected and through those electrons and so on so there's lots of deep thoughts around that which we can talk about forever yeah <laughs> Well, it came up a lot when PEI was in the dark. I remember getting a lot of phone calls from people thinking, hey, what could I do to become sort of a block parent on my block? You know, how can I set my home up so that I can island? And there are, it is possible here. Um, you do have to go through a process to make sure it's legit and you're not going to electrocute anyone uh, right. during a power outage. But yeah, there are techniques and tools to go um, and become that sort of safe spot on your block for anyone who is in need during a power outage, which is just a really important climate adaptation conversation we have to have. So, um, so thanks for bringing that up today. Yeah. God has a question about heat pumps. Oh yes, we get oh so many questions about heat pumps these days. Everyone's talking heat pumps. Um, at a cop or of three, okay. I'm sure that's that's an acronym COP of three or so if it was powered by a generator would it be better than direct burning propane. This is definitely too technical for me Do either of you want to take a stab at Scott's question. <laughs> yeah i'm not sure that I have the. Um, you know, I think it would require a little more analysis to understand um, the economics, but I think it is certainly a interesting question. And as we want to move away from um, propane resources or fossil fuels, um, but I'm not sure that the diesel generator is efficient enough to uh, really replace a, 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 a propane space heater. Mm -hmm. We do have a workshop, uh, Intro to Heat Pumps workshop on our website. Uh, Jean-Marie from Nate did it. Um, so you could definitely take a deep dive into that workshop if anyone's really keen on heat pump specifics. Andrea, do you want to add anything on heat pumps? No, I, I'd echo that. And I think, you know, um, we need to just look at those options at like com comparing things. I'm trying to, I was trying to find the question to read it more specifically, but it's, it's blasted in the chat. So, um, but yeah, it's, it, you have to think about those things a little bit more deeply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apologies that I don't have deep technical knowledge, but you know, uh, we do what we do. 
Okay, Elias is wondering, hi, Andrea, may I know more about the CAES in Brazil? Expecting it to be 3,000 people. I think you said 300 people, but did, was it 3,000? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just uh, back up there. Uh, the It kind of froze, so I got part of the question, but I think I understand it. Okay, so the compressed air energy storage system was a model that was uh, considered to, in the power planning of it, it was not in, it didn't end up getting built, but it was done in the model to show if we did put in a compressed air energy system, which is still very expensive to build and, and run, um, how would that function in the greater scope of the microgrid? Um, so it was 3,000 people and growing. So it's not um, it's not actually built on the island at this time. Mm, okay, interesting. I sure appreciated hearing some of those examples around the world because um, you know I have heard about this sort of leapfrogging that's happening in many communities where they're just bypassing um, the the whole process that we've gone through here in Alberta <laughs> of, of uh, electrifying rural parts and they're just jumping forward. So here we go. They're electrifying it in a different way, I guess. It's just alternatives. Patrick is saying, anyone using lead crystal batteries, question mark, supposedly much battery storage capacity, uh, much better storage capacity than lead acid at much less cost than lithium ion. Questions around lead crystal batteries. What do you two know about that subject? It's a new one for me, so I, sorry, I can't comment. No worries. Have you seen them around? I've heard of them, but I haven't seen them in operation yet. I think they're, um, um, yeah, I'd probably just leave it at that. I don't want to say something that is not well informed. Yeah, well, there's a lot of interesting new technology coming into the space as well. So it's hard to constantly be, I mean, I feel like you probably have to constantly update your presentation, Andrea, because of the <laughs> evolving technical landscape which is quite fascinating. Gordon's wondering, what is the expected lifetime of the battery bank? I'm thinking this is your battery bank, Greg. Yeah, I think, again, that's it's a little bit harder to qualify um, because it's based on your usage, your specific use case. But, uh, you know, the specifications of the batteries, they, they say, are like two to three times the lifetime of a lead acid, an equivalent lead acid battery bank. And uh, so... Um, We'll, uh, we'll see over time. Um, so we're expecting 10 years, I think, um, out, of, out of the system we've just uh, put in over the last year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other huge advantages is we, you know, you get, um, because you can get full depth of discharge on the uh, lithium battery bank, you know, it's uh, significantly smaller than an equivalent light acid system. Mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, just for later, Andrea, Tracy is asking if you could share the link to that article about the uh, health benefits of not losing power. I, I actually have a friend who's getting set up with at home dialysis and um, there's a lot more at home this and that going on these days in Alberta. So I, I think more and more people are going to be um, wondering about that example you gave and uh, all the wonderful health possibilities here um, for people who can't really go without power. Um, um, just to caveat on that, the article isn't about the health. That part I kind of I added in right now because I can tell you about that. But the article is about the system itself, and that system provided that. But we will have other articles coming out on the other aspects of that. So I'll, I can still keep in mind to um, get send it to you so you can send it to your membership. When it yeah, comes no, it's very interesting uh, because we are seeing more and more home care and kind of do it yourself home care here in Alberta. And, I, I suspect that will be a trend going forward. Um, so <laughs> I myself am learning, learning some do-it-yourself home care <laughs> lately for family members. So um, not involving electricity, but I definitely see why that's resonating with folks on the line here. All right, this recording will be shared after yes. Uh, so that answers that question. Uh, Jason is curious as to the type of biomass being used for the microgrid system on the island. Um, so it was just uh, a type of a local plant that was growing on the island at the time, um, and it was just projected what it would, how much we would need. And just to let you know that um, with that system, as well as it was designed, it was it didn't move forward because there was no long term uh, ability to commit to growing that much biomass in that region. So the learning from that is that you cannot just 
think you can take one tech, even though the technology might be suited to that area, that area might not be able to grow and produce enough feedstock to run it efficiently the way that you need it to run. So it comes back to how do we size the other things that can be done and going back to efficiency and conservation, sizing that appropriately. And then of course, looking at other options. So um, yeah, it, bioenergy is not always the only answer for stable, more stability in um, generation. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question about feedstock because there, there are some, some articles and things lately about questionable feedstock that may actually be <laughs> a pristine forest. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a, an interesting area to explore and make sure that people are using the right feedstock before taking that deep dive. Hey, yeah. we have so many questions and they are amazing. I'd like to invite you over to our interactive Q and A where you can turn your camera on and put your hand up and we will ask you a question just like you're um, in a regular old event. Uh, so please click on the link in the chat, exit this webinar and meet us over in a more relaxed Zoom meeting room. Thank you to everybody for attending today, to Greengate and EPCOR for sponsoring, to Andrea and Greg for their wonderful presentations. Uh, really a privilege to join you in this formal webinar and I look forward to seeing you all over in the Zoom meeting room shortly.